<laughs> okay, so this is slightly weird. I feel like I'm talking into space. Um, all right, so I'm Liz Rice. I look after open source engineering at Aqua Security. And I am uh, the author of a book about container security. And uh, I am currently the chair of the Technical Oversight Committee at the CNCF. And uh, despite my extensive technical qualifications, it took me a little while to figure out how to get this uh, session to work. But I think it's, I, I believe it's working now. So that's good. All right. Okay, so now I can find the Q&A button. And my impression is that if you have questions you'd like me to answer, you can put them into that Q&A session. All right, I hope everyone is uh, coping with this platform better than I seem to be. I think I'm okay now, All right. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, what's the best thing I can do to make my containers secure? This is the kind of thing that I could talk about all day. Um, so there are lots of different stages to the container life cycle and there are things that you can do to improve security all the way through the life cycle uh, but i would say if if you only had to do one thing i would recommend scanning container images for known vulnerabilities there are plenty of vulnerability scanners available out there um, you know some of them are commercial products but there are several free and open source options um, open source uh, container image scanners include Trivi from my team, uh, Anchor have a solution, there's Claire. So there are a few different options. And if you use a container image scanner, you will pick up when your images contain known serious vulnerabilities. So... Um, that prevents you from deploying something that is um, known to be very insecure. So because it's so simple to build something like that into your CI CD pipeline, that is high bang per buck. It's very easy to do and it uh, makes your deployment much more likely to be uh, secure. So I hope that answered the, the question. Um, I could talk about some other ideas for things that you can do to secure your containers. Um, not running as root. So I'm about to do a talk. I, I actually pre-recorded the talk, but very shortly, uh, my talk will be going out about rootless containers. And most of the time, as you'll see in that talk, by default, people run containers as root. That's the kind of default setting if you like and root inside the container is the same as root on the host so uh, if there were to be a container escape if somehow a container got compromised and uh, someone was able to escape from that container perhaps there's a vulnerability in the container runtime itself we've seen a few of those if it's unlikely to happen I don't want to scare anybody but if it does happen if you're running as root inside the container, you escape the container, you are root on the host. This is a bad, that's a bad situation. So that's kind of game over for your, uh, your security on that host. So uh, the, uh, the fact that you're running as root is something you want to avoid. Rootless containers is one option. Configuring a user. So um, in your Docker file, setting a user ID or in your YAML as you're configuring uh, your pods, you can define a user ID that you want to run under, make it non-root, that will be more secure. Uh, what do I love about working in open source? That's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool question. So I think the thing that I like best about open source is the feeling that you're interacting with people from kind of all around the planet people that you you've never met get some 
value something out of something that you've built and then they get in touch or they contribute to your project and and they give you um you know the 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 benefit of their their wisdom on their time and that's super um rewarding i think you know the the fact that you interact with people and and you feel like you've given them something or they've given you something and um and it's uh, you know ev- everybody is raising each other's game i think that's probably the thing i like best about open source plus everybody always seems to be so friendly and and welcoming you know i'm missing meeting people in real life at events and uh, and meetups and so on so i'm looking forward to getting back to that when uh, when things get a bit more back to normal uh oh very nice question here uh complimenting me on my keynote yesterday thank you <laughs> Uh, looks like I work on a lot of great things. Any advice for attaining work and life balance? Um, I've got to say that's probably something I wouldn't consider myself brilliant at Um, (laughs) because I I do have a bit of a tendency to commit to slightly too many things. Um, But I do I do carve out time. um, You know, I, I spend quite a lot of time doing um doing sport doing training and i kind of set aside time and and try very hard not to let anything encroach on that um my husband's very good at making sure i eat regularly which is uh, probably a very good thing um yeah i think maybe setting boundaries around the time you know i try very hard to avoid making a regular commitment to evening meetings because i you know i think it would be all too easy to fall into a world where you know your day stretches from eight in the morning till 11 at night and I don't think that is a a, you know a long-term path to success so I'm pretty protective of my out of hours time unless there's a really strong reason to 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 do something out of hours um technical question again okay are there some containers that have to run as root um, and there's an example of needing to open a low numbered port. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of software that has been containerized that was originally written in the era before containers designed to run on a host. And normally, if you want to open a low numbered port, you need privileges to do that. And those privileges come if you run as a root. Um, so you would typically run you know, a web server, for example, or load balancer, you you would typically run that as a privileged user because you needed the privileges on the host to open the low numbered port. If you're running inside a container, that is less less of an issue because you can you have port mapping. You can your code can be running thinking it's talking on port eighty, but that could be mapped to any port outside of the of the container. So that's no longer a good reason to have to run as root. So although a lot of software expects that it needs to run as root, it can usually be uh, reconfigured to to run on a different port. And there are um, some collections of container images. Um, For example, Bitnami did a lot of work to create um, versions of well-known popular images that can run as non-root software. So although you may find a lot of um, official images that do expect to run as root, there's usually a way that with a bit of work, you can find a a, a way to run uh, as a non-root user. Um, okay, along with Aqua, you work closely with the CNCF. What types of things do you work on with them? Yeah, so I... Um, uh, mostly the the work that I'm doing with the CNCF right now is with the technical oversight committee where we are with a group that sets the technical direction for the foundation in practice a lot of what we're doing is assessing projects that want to join um, and in practice in order to assess projects or, um, or help them move up the maturity scale from sandbox to incubation to graduation um, we actually spend quite a lot of time thinking about the criteria of what it means to be a graduated project and um, trying to figure out how we can scale those assessments and judgments um, 
we have a lot of projects that want to join which is fantastic but we're a you know group of volunteers with day jobs as well so um we uh recently well over the last year and year and a bit set up um special interest groups within the cncf that can help the toc so we can ask these special interest groups in let's say storage or security to help us with some of the technical assessment in particular projects and that helps us kind of share the workload which is really helpful um is helping run an open source project different uh easier harder than leading inside a big company like aqua um so aqua's not that big we're about 300 people so i mean it's not tiny but it's not like an enormous uh corporation uh i think i think that there's it it's very different i think if you're uh, inside a company a company will have particular um you know commercial goals typically and and defining those goals kind of top down yeah i, th I think that's usually the way that most uh, companies operate you know sort of have a top level goal and then that rolls out into um goals and kpis for teams and individuals i think in open source while you do you still have collective goals it's less um it's much more collaborative and much more kind of um you know, nobody's really going to get into a huge amount of trouble. It's more about um, uh, trying to find cooperative ways that where everybody gets something out of the contributions that they're making. So um, I, I like to think that internally in a in a company that's also my management style that I'm not kind of cracking some kind of whip and trying to get people to do things. I hope that you know by if, if we have a group of rational people and we all talk about what we want to achieve we will come up with a sensible way to achieve that together with our skills so in that sense i like to think that you can manage in a commercial organization in a similar way to what you do in open source but at the end of the day it is slightly different in that you you have these kind of the different incentives and the different um uh, goals that you're ultimately trying to achieve they can be complementary though and i'm lucky that i work for a company that allows me to spend time on open source and values the work that we're doing and we do it in a way that we you know is complementary to what we're doing as a commercial organization how did i get involved in open source um so <laughs> kind of almost by accident i think um, I actually remember years and years and years ago when I first came across open source being quite dismissive about the whole idea because I thought, well, how on earth can a team of volunteers possibly do a kind of real professional job? And, you know, why would they bother doing things like testing? And, and you know, surely they're just banging out code and they don't really care what happens. Of course, that's not true. You know, over time, I realized that that's not true. But that perception years ago put me off for, for a while. Um, and, but the way I got involved was um, really uh, working with startups. I, I spent a few years um, working in and, and co-founding startups that uh, mostly failed, but uh, we you know, learned a lot along the way. And um, in a startup, you're constantly trying to show people what you're doing. And I learned that I really liked kind of presenting things and my sort of engineer inside me wanted to show people technical things and I realized that you know there was this huge community of people who were interested in having these sort of technical conversations and you could show them a thing and they'd go that's really interesting L let me tell you about what I've done that's related and that kind of sucked me in so it was more through the kind of community events presenting that I got involved in the world of open source and that made me take the whole um the, the way that open source projects work much more seriously and I got much more interested in it and ended up you know making that kind of the focus of what I do as a job uh can I talk about Kubernetes security posture management so um yeah, this is really, 
it relates to um i think it's ghana have a um uh, i can't remember what they call it a term for called um, cloud security posture management which is the idea that when you set up your cloud infrastructure you need to there are some best practices you really should be applying like you know putting permissions on your storage so that not everybody on the whole internet can just go and look at your data uh you know making sure that your you have um multi-factor authentication set up so that you um uh you know to secure access to your console and cspm cloud postures cloud security posture management is about tools that check that you're applying those sort of sensible security practices so kspm is applying that similar thinking to kubernetes and saying what are the sensible settings you should uh, apply not just to your kubernetes configuration but also to the way that you're running your containerized workloads in kubernetes how can you configure them in a way that's secure and KSPM tooling is really assessing your YAML files, your configuration and saying, is it applying these security best practices? What do I enjoy working on the most? Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm a bit torn there between, um, I mean, I really, really, really like creating kind of content explanations typically talks and getting the sense that somebody has understood something because I because of the way I explained it and and when that lands when I when you know when somebody comes and tells me that they figured out how containers work you know they, they understood it because they saw one of my talks I think that is the thing that I find most rewarding um it's it's definitely um it's definitely that kind of sense of achievement when you feel like you've done something and other people appreciated it. Uh, in projects that you've worked on, do you have any what not to do lessons? Oh, um, <laughs> how long have we got? Um, <laughs> uh, I think, so the first thing I would say when I first got involved in open source was you know, worrying too much about perfection and, and thinking that, you know, if I put code out, uh, people would look at it and, you know, find all the flaws and think that I was a terrible engineer. And in practice, you, anything you can publish, people don't really pour over it in, in very great detail. But also, you know, everybody who's ever written any code knows what it's like to you know improve it and that it never really feels completely finished and that you're always wanting to make it better so i think getting over that idea that you you know that it's not good enough it is good enough ship it get it out into the into the world and see whether or not you know how people react to it, it that would be so the what not to do would be don't kind of hide your code and you know try and polish it too much before you show people get feedback early um, I think another thing that we're learning about a lot in our own projects in Aqua is trying to figure out the the way to um, kind of ha be helpful and welcoming to community members. There's been a lot of great, great talks about that today, and and you know at other events in the past where we you know we talk a lot about community and making projects accessible for people to help out and get involved and actually the reality day to day is oh my god there's so many things coming in on github and how can we how can we answer them all and how can we make sure people aren't you know frustrated because we haven't responded to them in a timely fashion um i think that balance making sure that we're kind of doing work and also responding to other people's work <clears throat> in a timely fashion I feel like that's something that I'm still trying to get to grips with what the right balance is there. Uh, okay, I think uh, we are pretty much through all the questions. Thank you very much everyone who asked some questions. Appreciate that. Um, 
if you are still online, the next thing that I would, you know, love your feedback on is uh, my talk on rootless containers that's coming up at quarter past the hour, so in three minutes. So I might go and uh, take three minutes to, uh, since I don't see any last questions coming in, I will take those last three minutes to go and grab myself a cup of tea and uh, hopefully answer some questions while my talk is streaming out. So thank you very much.